Okay, so these principles of design are not something that is just inherently a talent that people have. Um, it's something you can learn. Just like you can learn how to create music, you can learn how to create art, you can learn how to tell stories, you can learn how to read, you can learn how to analyze data, you can learn statistics. Um, the principles of graphic design are totally learnable and um, you can do this stuff. Um, there are a whole bunch of different ways of you know, organizing the principles of design. You read about a couple different systems in Kieran Healy's chapter. Um, he talked about the Gestalt principles that were created by um, some German designers back in the 1800s or a few hundred years ago. Um, and there are lots of important principles there. Um, I have no issues with them. Um, it's just that they're hard to remember. Um, there are some important things in the Kieran Healy readings with the Gestalt principles for data visualization, especially when he talks about pre-attentiveness and how it's. Um, he had the example of being able to find a red dot amid a sea of blue dots. If there's just one, it's easier to see. If you're trying to find a whole bunch of different red and blue, it's harder because um, it changes the way you, you think about the data. Um, and so th those are important principles too, so definitely remember the Gestalt principles. Um, but you don't have to like memorize them. You can look them up as you're designing stuff. Um, what you will have to memorize is um, the stuff that we're going to cover right now. And so even with the Gestalt principles and these other principles I'm going to teach you, people have been debating what makes good design for centuries, for millennia. Um, there are a whole host of different ways that you can define what makes good design. You can go get a PhD in art history and fight about um, what makes good art with other art, his art historians, and that's great. Um, for the sake of this class, um, the four main principles you need to remember are this acronym here, CRAP, uh, which stands for Contrast, Repetition, Alignment, and Proximity. And the, the reason this is useful is because one, it's memorable. Um, but two, you can use it as kind of a checklist um, as you're critiquing different designed objects or as you're creating your own designs. Um, you can look at the design and check the contrast and make sure there's, there's enough contrast there. You can check to see if there's repetition. You can check to see if elements are aligned on the page or on the screen. And you can check proximity to see if there's groupings. Um, and it's really easy to do. Once you master these four principles, you'll be able to look at um, advertisements on MARTA, you'll be able to see little the little uh, flyers that people post in the library and in other public locations, um, and you'll be able to criticize them and critique them and improve them um, based on your knowledge of contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. Um, these principles, I did not invent them. Um, they come from this book here, this non-designer's design book by Robin Williams. This is not the the comedian. This is a graphic designer who's been publishing about kind of these core principles and making it very accessible to people who are not designers, which is, I'm assuming, all of you. Um, and so this is not a, a required book for the course, but I would recommend getting it um, just as a good reference for any time you ever have to create anything um, for your jobs, even beyond data visualizations. If you have to make some sort of poster or some sort of handout for a meeting, you can make those things look a ton better very quickly as long as you understand these principles and there's a billion examples in this book and it's a great book so get it i'm not getting paid for that but this is a life-changing book um so what we're going to do now is go through these four principles quickly um, you'll get more practice with this with the assignment for today um, where you'll actually do a redesign of of a flyer that I'll give you. Um, and in the example for today, I also walk through a design and I record myself making all of the, the redesigns and show you how to use um, different programs to do that. Um, so to begin with, um, the first principle that we care about is contrast, the C in crap. Um, and so this is, um, the main principle here is that if two things are not exactly the same, make them different. Um, and make them really different and don't be a wimp about it. And so this is, um, there are a whole bunch of different ways to add contrast to designs, and so we'll look through a few different examples here. Um, one easy way to add contrast is with type families. So if you've ever noticed fonts, um, fonts come in um, specific families where they have similar characteristics. Um, and they have, um, especially in like their letter forms here. So if you look at this table here, it shows a whole bunch of different fonts. Um, the very first row shows serif fonts. So serifs are these little things at the 
at the edges of the letters here, these little uh, things that are sticking out, um, little decorative uh, flares in the letter forms here. Um, those um, were invented back when, uh, back a long time ago when printing presses were becoming a thing. It was a way of kind of mimicking handwriting and cursive. Um, our eyes are good at using these serifs to kind of guide um, our reading along. Um, and so this kind of text is really good for kind of large blocks of text. It helps us read them um, better. And so um, serif fonts look like that. Sans serif fonts, the sans comes from, or from French, which means without. Um, they are letter forms without any serifs. And so if you look at the, the little edges of the S here, it has these flares. In a sans serif world, it doesn't. None of these have the little edges that kind of guide your reading. Um, and so sans serif fonts are traditionally used in print um, for like headings and for titles and for things that you don't have to read for prolonged periods of time. Um, they're also used commonly on screens. It was um, back in like the 90s when they had screens that didn't, that didn't have super high resolution. It was hard to render all of the little serifs um, very precisely because there weren't enough pixels. And so lots of early text on screens um, was done in sans serif font. Nowadays, we have a billion pixels on screens. And so having the serifs there is fine. Um, people have done research to see if you can read faster with serif or sans serif fonts and there's not really any difference. Um, so kind of the, the traditional wisdom is use serif for lots of text, use sans serif for big text, but nowadays we're good at reading both and so you can you can do both. Um, another font family here is slab serif where it has serifs, just like a regular serif font, but the serifs are gigantic. Um, and so the one way to remember this is like, if you think of wanted posters from like the 1800s in the Wild West, um, those had big giant slabs on them. And so that's kind of the slab serif idea. Um, you also have script fonts, which look like handwriting. Um, you have monospaced fonts, which are typically used for code. Um, the reason they're monospaced is every single letter here has exactly the same width, no matter how big the letter itself is. So if you look at this I, it's kind of a skinnier letter. Um, M is a fairly wide letter, um, but they're exactly the same width. And so if you have like a whole bunch of code on a screen and you're trying to figure out uh, to get everything aligned with like the number of characters, the M and the I won't kind of move the alignment back and everything will be aligned in columns. Um, you'll rarely use this for actual design work because it is harder to read. Um, it's generally easier to read things with um, spacing in between these letters. So if you look back at like the sans serif font, this I is very skinny compared to the M. Um, you could fit like three I's in the space of that M there. So those are um, typographic families. If you want to add contrast to something, um, one good strategy is to use contrasting type families. And so combine a serif font with a sans serif font. So if you're doing like a book or an article, you'll do a whole bunch of serif text and you'll do a completely different sans serif font for headings and for chapters and for subheadings and for other elements on the page. And that adds a lot of contrast um, typographically. Or you can choose a slab serif font for your headings and your chapter titles, and you can use a sans serif font for your text. Um, generally, the, the recommendation is to choose two fonts or three fonts from these different type families, but not within the families. You don't want to choose two serif fonts um, because they don't provide enough contrast. So if you look at this example here, um, that right there, the here's a heading, and this paragraph here, those are two different sans serif fonts. One is Times New Roman and one is Garamond. But you can't really tell the difference because there's not a ton of contrast there. So if we just, we, we don't change anything except changing the font, um, all we did here is we made this a slab serif heading and then a sans serif um, body text there. And just by doing that, it looks a ton better than the, the non-contrasting two serif fonts that we had there. And so that adds typographic contrast and it, it makes a better design. Um, you can also use the same font. Lots of well-made fonts um, have different weights to them. 
Um, you're familiar with some way. It's like in, in Word when you're typing with Calibri, you can click on the bold button and you'll have Calibri bold, which is thicker. Um, in more modern versions of Word, it'll also have Calibri light, which is a lighter version of Calibri. Um, if you go to Google Fonts and search for the most popular um, uh, sans serif fonts, you'll find some with like 18 different weights to it. Um, and that's like super cool because you can actually do a whole designed object or design um, document with one font. Instead of adding like contrasting sans serif and, and serif and slab serif, you can just have one font throughout the whole document, but use contrasting weights to, to add the contrast. So if you look here, we have extra light fonts that are very, very, very skinny. Um, you have black fonts that are very, very, very thick, but it's all the same font family. So the letter shapes are the same, the W is the same. Um, and so one thing you can do is combine these um, and give, if you give enough contrast, it'll look pretty good when you make a design. So if you look at this example here, there's a heading um, and then there's this body text here, but there's not really any contrast between them. So if we just add, um, this is semi-bold and this is light, um, just doing that is enough contrast to make it kind of stand apart, make the heading stand apart, and it, it makes it look like a better design. Had we done something like medium and regular or extra light and light, those are two different weights, but they're not very contrasting and it's not a very strong contrast and so you won't be able to tell. And so the recommendation to not be a wimp, that's an example of not being of being a wimp is if you if you look back here, if you chose light and regular, that's not a lot of contrast. Or if you chose bold and black, it's going to be really hard to see any difference there. But if you choose extra light and bold, or light and black, or something um, where there's stronger contrast, that's going to be a better design with more contrast in it. You can also use size to add contrast to your designs. Um, you can have really big text, you can have really small text, you can have really big pictures, you can have really small pictures. Um, this is fairly self-explanatory here um, because you're all familiar with sizes. Um, you can also add contrast with colors. Um, this is a very complex field of design. Um, you can get a PhD in color theory and um, spend your whole career figuring out the best ways to find contrasting colors. We're not going to worry about any of that. Um, there are resources that help you choose good contrasting colors. Um, so Adobe has a website called color.adobe.com. Um, and you can use a color wheel there, um, like you did back in third and fourth grade art classes, um, where you can create triads of colors and complementary colors and different forms of complementary colors, like this split complementary here. And it lets you create good contrasting colors based on um, color theory and lots and lots of research about what makes good colors. Um, and so if you notice here, um, like this this light blue and that dark blue, that's probably a good strong difference and a good strong contrast. This light blue and that green, that's a good contrast. Um, here, this is monochromatic, and so all of these are kind of the same tint of blue, which is fine. This is kind of like using the different weights of a font. If you're going to use two colors throughout your visualization or throughout your document, you're probably going to want to choose like this dark one and this light one because that provides good contrast. If you chose like this one here and this one here, those are way too close together and that's kind of a wimpy contrast and it's not gonna look great. And so if you want to find good contrasting colors, you can use this uh, color.adobe.com tool to find that. Another cool thing that um, Adobe has on that same website is you can actually upload a picture. So here's a picture of Atlanta here and it'll choose the most prominent kind of contrasting colors from that picture and make a palette for you. And so this right here could be our Atlanta at sunset palette that we could then use if we were doing some sort of report about urban issues in Atlanta. We could use those as our graph colors. We could use those as different font colors. Um, they are good contrasting. They're not overly close together, except for these ones on the edges here. Um, but this is kind of a lighter version of that. Um, and so that's a good color palette that was taken from kind of an actual photograph, which is another way of finding contrasting colors. Um, one thing that you should pay attention to, especially when you start working with colors in data, is the accessibility of those colors. Um, 
color wheels, if you look back here, um, there's actually math behind how distant these colors are if you look at this complementary wheel here. Um, and so what you have to do if you're making colors that are mapped onto data is you want to choose colors that are kind of equally distant from each other. You're not going to just choose random colors like this blue and that green and this lighter blue. Um, you want to choose colors that are meaningful. And this is hard to do. There are color scientists that have been trying to figure out the best way to do this. And I'll show some examples of this um, and show some different R packages in the future of, of ways of choosing good perceptually uniform colors that kind of follow a color scheme. Um, and so we'll talk about that. Another thing you need to worry about is accessibility. Um, you'll want to choose colors that are safe for colorblind users of your designs. Um, so 8% of men and half a percent of women have some form of colorblindness. And the most common form of that is red-green colorblindness. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to make sure that your designs are safe for them to read. So if you only have two colors and no labels and you're just trying to show the values of yes and no, our general instinct is to use like red for no and green for yes because it's like a stoplight. Um, but if you're just using only those two colors and you know, have no extra labels or anything pointing at what those things mean, um, it's just going to look gray, kind of different shades of gray blobs to uh, people who can't see the difference between red and green. And so you want to be able to, to check that the colors that you choose are contrasting enough to people with colorblindness. There are tools online. If you go to the, the course website to the resources tab, um, I have uh, a page there with different color resources and there are several links there that you can use to upload images and it'll show you what it looks like to people with different forms of colorblindness. So you can see if there's enough contrast in the colors you choose. Um, so one example of this is if you look at um, these kind of typical palettes that people use for things, um, the most typical that people love to use, like in weather reports, like the National Weather Service loves this stuff, is the rainbow palette. Um, we like looking at maps with rainbows. The issue with that is that it's not perceptually uniform. This is why perceptual uniform uh, scales were invented. So moving like the same distance from this color to here doesn't cause the same amount of color change as moving from here to here at the same distance. And so the colors don't get mapped onto data very well. Um, and so one alternative color palette to this rainbow thing is this Viridis palette, which has other palettes in it called magma and plasma um, and other things. And the nice thing about these palettes is they are perceptually uniform and they're generally colorblind safe. And so if you look at these same palettes here, this is what it looks like to somebody with red-green colorblindness. And so you can tell here, like if you had a color scale where lower values were down here um, in kind of the purple area and higher values were up in the orange area, that's going to be dark yellow and it's going to be the same dark yellow. Um, and so there's only kind of this bluish region here. But then once you start getting into this, this whole world here is kind of the same yellowish thing. And that's really hard to make any, um, to be able to distinguish what's happening there. The Viridis panel on the palette, on the other hand, goes from kind of this yellow here to this darker blue, and it's consistent across the whole palette, which is really nice. So keep that in mind when you're making designs. Make sure that there's good accessibility um, to all of your users. Um, this is what it would look like. So here's a map of Georgia. Each of these counties are scaled, or they're filled by how big the area is. So the larger counties. Um, are more purple. But this is a typical rainbow palette, which isn't very great because um, it's hard to see kind of the scale between purple and green and red. And if you were looking at this as a colorblind person, it would look very, very green, and that's basically all. And so if you um, use this Veritas paddle, or palette, um, you see kind of these lighter, yellower regions versus the, the bluer, darker regions. Or if you look at the Inferno palette, which is part of the Viridis world of perceptually uniform colors, um, you can also see kind of better differences in, in county sizes there because of the colors. And so there's better contrast with this and with the Viridis here, and not enough contrast with the Rainbow palette. Okay, so that's contrast. 
Repetition is the next letter in our CRAP acronym. And repetition just means that you repeat things in your design throughout the design. Um, so you can repeat lots of different things. Um, you can repeat colors. And so if you choose, like if we go back to that Atlanta sunset example, we can use those three colors and repeat them throughout and have all of our headings be one specific color and have all of the subheadings be a shade of that color or a different color or something and just have it be kind of consistent throughout the throughout the design. You can also repeat fonts and so you're not going to want to change fonts every time you get to a new chapter. You're not going to want to change fonts um, and choose a whole bunch of different serif fonts and a whole bunch of different sans serif fonts. Just choose one or two and repeat those throughout. Um, you'll want to repeat other graphical elements, and so if you have, if you're making like a, a brochure or some sort of um, annual report for a nonprofit, you're going to want to kind of have the same look and feel for all of your stock photography and for your logos and other things you're putting in there. You want it to feel kind of like it's tied together, and you can repeat alignments, which we'll talk about with the next letter in our acronym here. So as kind of a good example of this, this is Oxfam's annual report from 2019, um, two different pages from it. Um, and so what's really cool here, if we were in class together, I would have you all identify things that are repeated throughout each, or throughout this design here. And so, um, because we're not all together, I will just point those things out. Um, but hopefully you'll, you'll start getting kind of a taste for how to identify repetition here. So if you look at the, the, the page titles here, um, it's kind of this uppercase sans serif font with this, this funky coloring behind it. Um, here, it's this turquoise and blue color that, that's used throughout the page. And so the same blue is used here. Um, over here, we have this that same funky pattern that you have there, but we have red and pink fuchsia, and we have dark purple. But that same pink is used here in the in the subtitle, and it's used in all of the headings. So that's well repeated. Um, they're repeating the idea of having two stock photographs on each page here. Um, the caption for the stock photographs is kind of uppercase here, all caps, saying which photo it goes to, and then it uses this sans serif font for explaining what it is. That's the same sans serif font that's used for the, the body of the, the text here. And so everything's kind of repeated. If you had, if you had a whole bunch of different pages from different um, annual reports from different organizations um, with, that were all separated, you would very easily be able to connect these to kind of the same organization based on the design repetition there. The elements are all repeated and easy to follow. And so that's a, a good example of repetition here. Um, the third element of our principles of graphic design is alignment which means everything on the page should have a visual connection with something else on the page or in the design or on the screen or whatever you're designing. So one easy way of looking at this and thinking about this, if you look at this image here, this is from um, some electrical engineering handbook, and it's a good example of bad alignment. Um, if you look at it, um, there are three different boxes that are kind of on the page, but they're not really connected with each other. This top the top of this box, if you drew a line all the way out here, it it doesn't line up with this thing. Or if you draw a line straight down the side of it, it doesn't line up with that. Um, and so nothing really kind of feels like it's in place on the page. All we have to do to make it look a ton better and to feel better designed is move those boxes around and move the text around so that everything is aligned and connected to something else on the page. We didn't change any fonts, we didn't change any colors. All we did um, here was we um, just moved everything so it's nice and strongly, al strongly aligned on the left and everything's aligned at the top here and it looks a lot better connected. That's all we had to do. Um, and so one way of checking this um, in real life when you're, when you're critiquing designs, when you're making your own designs, is to draw lines either with your mind or if you're using a fancy tool like Adobe Illustrator or Adobe InDesign or Photoshop, there are ways of adding kind of guidelines onto the page and dragging them in from the side. PowerPoint lets you do this as well. And so it lets you, you know, physically line things up with the guidelines that are on the page. 
And so looking at here, if you were going to critique this first um, this first design here, you could say you, there's multiple alignments um, or vertical alignments here. There's more, multiple horizontal alignments. Um, and so one way of improving that is just getting them all to line up. And so if you look here, um, we have one straight line going up and down and two straight lines going across. And those are the only alignments we have. And it looks a lot better just doing that. So that's alignment. Um, you can also combine these different principles. So we've talked about contrast kind of by itself. We've talked about repetition by itself. Um, but you can also have contrasting alignment. And so one very common way you've all done this, um, every class paper you write um, looks like this, in part because like the Chicago Manual of Style, the American uh, Psychology Association's Manual of Style, everybody says like center your headings and then put your text in the left. Um, which is fine, that's actually contrast in alignment. Um, you have one alignment and then a slightly different alignment, but that breaks the whole don't be wimpy principle of contrast. Um, and so one way of adding stronger contrast with your alignment is to do something like this and have um, some things be right aligned and some things be left aligned. And that provides a lot more a stronger contrast um, by mixing those two different alignments. Um, the final principle is proximity. And this is probably the simplest one out of the, the four principles, in part because it just means you group things together that should be together. Um, and so you can do that grouping with a whole host of different tools. You can use white space, you can do color, you can do location, you can put things on the page um, in places that, that make sense. And so one example of this is this uh, fake business card here, um, which is very common. You'll see lots of business cards like this, or lots of um, memos that look like this, or all sorts of designed objects that look like this, where you just kind of want to fill the page. And so here we have the name of the company, um, and then this is the guy's name, and then his phone number's up here, and his location's there, like that's his address, I guess. Um, but there's no, there are no logical groupings here. All we have to do here to fix this, we don't have to change any fonts, um, we don't have to change any colors. All we're going to do is move things around and make it so they're grouped. So now we have the name of the company and the guy's name, and then we have the address and phone number down there. Um, it does have repeated alignment now, um, where everything is centered. And so we don't have any contrast in alignment, but that's fine because we're also repeating the alignments. And so that's also fine. So we're mixing the different principles. Um, but here, like now we have proximity. We could also create that proximity um, with color. If we wanted to make this one color and this a lighter color, um, that would be another way of you know, adding the proximity element to it, but with um, contrast. We could also make this one font and this a different font. Um, maybe this a big slab serif font and maybe this a lighter serif font, something like that, uh, to add contrast, which then helps build the proximity. Okay, so as a quick review of these principles. Um, so if you can just memorize these principles and always think about how to apply them to design things that you see, um, this will make all your designs way better. So first we care about contrast. So if you look at the example here, we have contrasting fonts. So this is a, a good serif font that is white on a black background. And then it has the sans serif font below it that's not in any background. Um, this actually is repeated with, down, with the, the black background down here. Um, but repetition is on this one here. If we look at repetition, this, mean, this just means repeat some aspect of the design throughout. So here we have the serif font that's repeated and the sans serif font that's repeated down here. And she also added this triangle thing here um, that's repeated throughout just to kind of give extra flavor to the design. Alignment, here everything is right aligned. If she wanted to add contrast, she could have potentially had this be left aligned. Um, and that's good contrasting alignment there, but everything has one line that you can follow here. And then finally, we have proximity, where this part is grouped. This is the title and the subtitle. And then this is the author and the date. And those are logical groupings there. And so it's easier to follow. And so those are the core uh, principles of graphic design for this class. 
um, when I look at your projects and when I look at your different assignments, um, what I'm going to be grading on is this checklist. I'm going to go through and check for contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity. I will make comments for each of those letters. And so if you want to do well with those, you just do the same thing. Go through the checklist and make sure there's good contrast, make sure things are repeated, make sure there's shared alignment, um, and make sure there's good proximity, and you'll be able to make well-designed things with just those four principles.